between 1.2 and 1.4 trillion. Of that, of those deals, some 60% had nothing to do with the UK at all. They're essentially foreign trades. But our sovereign tax base had to underwrite them. Why was there, did our sovereign tax base have to underwrite them? Because the neoliberalism that we created, actually, in order to bring capital to those countries, said we'll underwrite the risk. As a result, this means there is no return or security for capital if it goes out to the locality. So it centralises and locks in there. And that's why there's nothing to lend in the peripheries. What we have to do is break up the financial system, break up the banks, stop the state underwriting and mispricing capital so as to return the price of investment capital to the localities. Allied with that, we need to create massive regional and localised investment banks. We need to recycle our own savings, not through proxy ownership, through pension <coughs> funds that they invest in Wall Street or the City of London. But we need to use our own savings for that reprice localised capital so that we create infrastructure so that our own economies can rise up and develop. Then we need to integrate our universities and our skills with those local economies so that all the skill networks don't flee towards the centre because that's where capital is and that's where the re rewards, returns and careers are. If we can ally both political and economic decentralisation, if we can challenge through better competition law and through a better account of monopoly, the role of the state, and a critique of vested interest, then we might have a chance. We might have a democratic chance. I'm interested, for instance, not in making local town halls more accountable, though of course I am. I'm interested in why not give streets democracy? Why not give a state's democracy? Why not let an estate or a street control some tiny portion of its budgetary expenditure? If you let even the smallest organisation of human community control a part of its space to feel some power, then they might have some faith in democracy. Because all we're seeing across the West is massive disengagement from politics. And why do people disengage? Because they think they can't influence anything. They can't even influence what time the lights go on in their own street. So if we could, in some sense, restore that, restore that within economy, then we can begin to build civil society. And building civil society is the only path to a true liberty and a real freedom. And that is creating groups that can exercise power, that can create their own culture, can repeat their own culture and shape their own communities in the way that they want. And that is the future middle of Western politics. And that is the future of liberty. And that's where I hope we're going to get to. Thank you very much. to subject you to all of that. <laughs> uh, Philip is willing to take some questions. And we have a microphone. I'm glad that it was so uncontestable, you know. <laughs> feel the same level of, you know. Thank you. Really enjoyed your talk. Very provocative. Lots to think about. Um, so uh, this is basically a kind of historical question or and also a philosophical question where do you locate yourself philosophically um, you've condemned liberalism quite uh, strongly um, and um, you've gestured towards classical liberalism as perhaps more acceptable than contemporary liberalism um, you've dismissed neoliberalism um, <coughs> So I, I have a little sort of taxonomy here, and I'm just wondering where, where you fit into it. There's classical and medieval kind of a, a view of politics and of the human person. Then there's classical liberalism. Then there's some kind of uh, neoliberalism. And then maybe there's something new, something that is some kind of new development. But the reason I ask this question is just because I think there may be something at stake in whether we think of ourselves as liberals. Um, in particular, classical liberalism, many people would think the problem started 
or you know, was well underway when classical liberalism reconceived society and human relationships. Um, so I guess I'm just wondering whether you you would uh, nail your mask mast to the classical liberalism or something before that or something after that. I'm sorry it sounds a bit confusing, but no, 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 it's fine. Um, the, the point I'm making is it's very important when you argue this that you're not seen as somebody who's opposed to liberty. The reason I'm against modern liberalism is it doesn't deliver on liberty. That's the main point. And so there's something wrong with modern liberalism. And modern liberalism oscillates between statism and individualism. They're the same thing. And why, why does that happen? Precisely because modern liberalism can't give any account of objective goods. Now, for me, liberty is a secondary or tertiary good. It emerges after you've defined norms. And those norms have been founded in what the society takes to be objectively true. And once you define those norms, then you can have freedom, because you only have freedom within norms. If all there is is freedom, then everything is arbitrary. And if everything is arbitrary, then there are no norms, and all there is is power. And if all there is is power, then the most powerful always triumph. Which is what, you know, Goebbels said in his diaries. That's why he said, I like this modern paradigm, because it makes people like me possible. Whereas actually uh, an account of objective goods is the great defence against modern tyranny. And so that's really how I'd situate it. And for me, my politics would be a virtue politics. doesn't mean I'm particularly virtuous. I'm, I'm really not. I'm terribly decadent and do all manner of inappropriate uh, things. <laughs> I travel. I like talking to people sometimes in bars, et cetera, et cetera. But <laughs> the point is, is that is this, is, this isn't anti-society. This is about creating the good society. And I believe in a virtue politics, that whereby you're free in respect, precisely because you have objective goods. And then you can create a debate about those objective goods. One particular question would be, in, in light of that, in light of the sense of the virtue base, and also the discussion that you've had bef before about uh, giving local uh, autonomy to, to local, even, even streets, what happens when a street does something bad? What, it, when, what happens when they make... Obviously, we bomb them. I don't have anything bad going on. Good God. I mean, that's the yeah, argument, sorry. I would say, in terms of, of especially in, in, in the United States, of, a, of movement from, from localities to centralized planning and, and centralized organizations have been a justice issue in saying that local, that, you know, for instance, I'm thinking of the South and, and, yeah. and, and civil rights in the 60s. No, I think that's an important point. I mean, and it's a point that you always happens, uh, wherever you say, I believe in locality, you know, good people, so, God, the Nazis will take over, you know. And in certain countries, that's kind of a bit silly. In other countries, like, you know, your point about deep south, it's not silly. But for me, localism is the precondition of, of forming a collective interest. And um, what it allows you to do is create a politics of that common interest. It has to. I mean, think of Saul Alinsky's work, just to take a different tack. What that was all about is creating community where there is not. Our current dispensation has created that fascism and that racism. That's already there, and we've had decades of this. What we need is a new politics of the common interest. And that politics of the common interest can only be around things that people share. And things that people share in their vicinity is their locality. And so that's where I think a truly successful anti-racist, anti-fascist politics must begin. It's happening in London, where London citizens, who are the British version of you know, the Urban Areas Foundation, are making common cause between Jews, Muslims, and Christians over their communities, precisely in order to drive crime off the streets and make it safe for everyone's children to walk home. That's the politics that I believe in. But I don't... For, you know, there will be moments when you know, bad people capture certain organisations. But at that point, there's, it's very easy, I think, to create an account of 
what would be uh, vested interest. You can set certain limits. A certain proportion of people need to be involved. The more people that are involved, the higher the level of budget they can exercise, so on and so forth. And you can also have, you know, challenge from one group to from another group about legitimacy. So I think there's enough ways we can think of to prevent that. But I think actually it's exactly localism that will actually deal finally with that issue. Because in the end, in the end, it's down to finding common interest. And in the end, that's about the world we share. And in the end, you share most of that world with those who are close to you. Yes, you are. You mentioned the, uh, the critique of Belloc, who is certainly kind of one of the prototypes of, of this uh, sort of thinking. And uh, one of the things that Belloc uh, kind of endorsed, which would be problematic certainly from a modern libertarian standpoint, is the, this very bulky state mechanism for the breaking up of the capital centers and uh, the banking so system. It's differential tax system. The bigger you are, the more tax you pay. Exactly. And uh, I think a lot of people kind of see a threat in that of empowering the, the central state organization even more so than it already uh, has accrued power to itself. So I was wondering if you could comment on kind of another vein in the tradition after Belloc, which is sort of the agrarian uh, approach to, to those things, both in the uh, American agrarian movement, but also the land movements of England and Scotland, and how local economy could be fostered through, through that kind of movement. No, thank you very much. Uh, uh, another lovely question. Um, I think you answered the, the first point sort of, you know, such that I didn't need to. I think there are mechanisms by which you can, you can give... You see, I don't believe in privileging the small over the big. You know, I don't like the idea of a, a sort of, uh, you know, a local nuclear industry or a local sort of army that might take shape or, you know, a local air force, you know. Wars between streets, <laughs> you know, Somalia, you know, need I go on. So, so I think that um, the point is, is that is I believe in subsidiarity is the most appropriate. Uh, subsidiarity doesn't favour the small; it favours the most appropriate. So, if a care of human beings, and well, I think there's an astonishing percentage of prisoners are actually were in state care. And those prisoners are in state care almost always have the worst indices of, of reoffending. It's very clear that the state is a very poor parent and people should be fostered by other human beings. Um, so that would be the most appropriate. But with something like water, over land where you had differential waterfall, I think a localised water solution could cause political problems. So I think that, um, yes, that, that's, that's how one decides it. Now, it's a very interesting question. How do you break up capital? How do you break up concentrations of capital? Well, part of what I'm arguing is we incentivise the decentralisation of capital by removing the tax privileging for centralising it. That's part of, part of the issue. Another part of the issue is for us to behave differently. For us to actually, why not group around and form our own businesses, buy out our own malls, form our own cooperative enterprise. I know it sounds dreadful and, and you think, oh God, it'd be awful. But actually, if you do it well, it's much, much better than anything else. And how about going in, making common cause with local farmers to create your own markets and then getting your school board to, to purchase locally, not purchase nationally. And by purchasing locally, you get a much higher multiplier effect. For instance, and this is from memory, this isn't necessarily an exact quote. I think the pound that you spend in a transnational is worth roughly four times less than the pound you spend locally. The pound you spend locally will have a multiplier effect. But as a pound you spend nationally, it's kind of segregated off uh, somewhere else. So if you create a local economy, you might pay marginally more, but your percentage return will be maximally that much more. So I think you have to think of all the innovative, innovative ways to do that. And then you have, that, that's the soft, that's soft, that's the soft approach. There's also the hard approach, competition law. You know, if you're really a free marketeer, which very few people really are, when people say free marketeers, they say, they're essentially saying, I go with the winners. That's what most of them mean. But if you're a real serious free market thinker, and some of the best conversations I've had with serious free market thinkers with whom I do not disagree, they say, no, we need to break up concentrations of power. This isn't the capitalism we were promised. This isn't the market we want. And I agree with them. So I think we do all of that. And precisely we do all of that because do you want to live life as a serf? 
What's the life of a serf? You and your wife or your husband never having enough money, trapped in low jobs, unable to subsidise an ordinary decent standard of living, taking on more and more debt. Well, it's already like that. It's already like that for people. In Britain, uh, if you add up all corporate debt, state debt and personal debt, we're at about 468% of GDP. 468% of GDP. That means 20 years of deleveraging. The US, and again, this is from memory, this might not be an exact quote, I think it's about 3.7% of GDP, the same measure. And McKinsey think that's a good 10 to 20 year deleveraging. That's what we're facing. We can't go on with the same rhetoric. Do you see any tension between localism and globalism? And if so, how do you resolve it? Uh, I think that's a very good question again. There's no going back from the global world. You know, there's no going back to Wattle and Daub economics. I'll grow my own oranges. It'd be very difficult in Scotland. It kind of wouldn't work. And I like oranges. <laughs> you know, I quite like foreign tra travel. See, yeah, I told you I'm a bad person. You know. Um, I think there's new ways under the present paradigm for the local and the, glo uh, and the global to trade. I think it's genuinely true. There's new possibilities. And modern technology makes it possible. That old, remember the old kind of kitsch agrarian idea of the family homestead being an economic unit? You know, led the Confederacy. It was kind of, that was what people believed and wanted. Economically, it's now, sorry, technologically, it's now possible. That's what they're doing in Scandinavia. Off the coast of Norway, there's weird little islands where like about 14 people live, but they have about 30% of the hover, world hovercraft market. Precisely because they can use the internet to source all their materials, to outsource all their designs, and they just do the assembling there. So paradoxically, the old business model is we'll, house, we'll do in-house R&D, we'll do in-house fabrication, massive, massive costs for an industry. Now, and this is what's right about Wiki economics, now we can outsource it to anywhere else in the world, have a competitive tender out there on the web, and choose. Now what's even more interesting, remember that thing called trust? God, we can't do trust anymore, all modern neoliberals, we hate each other, we want to kill... Rape, pillage, well, not, you know, within, you know, whatever the state lets me do, that's what we'll do. But the point is, is actually trust is the new business model. Think of eBay. eBay is nothing other than the global leveraging of your reputation in the marketplace. That's all it is. It's a trust model. It says, I've dealt with this person 50 times and they haven't ripped me off. Therefore, every single deal that that person does, it's not worth them ripping anybody off because their reputation is worth so much more. So that makes the old ideas of like trust, reputation, guilds, much more applicable. So I actually think the new paradigm we're talking about actually allows for the very things I'm talking about. This isn't kind of kitsch. This is the future, in part. So I genuinely think there's a way of, of counselling that opposition to all human benefit. Uh, a question close to home. What role do colleges and universities play in educating citizens and community members for the type of communitarian vision that you're proposing? It's very interesting. I mean, what, what do most universities do well, in the humanities department, they teach you uncertainty, don't they? They don't teach you the truth. They don't teach you what they think is true. They're like engines of sophistry that you turn out and the, the most dominant, profound message that you're taught is, oh, it's your choice. You know, this, this is hedge, this... Essentially, what you're taught in my, in my country at age 16 in an English A-level is what you're taught in my country at age 26 in an English B.A., it's really difficult, it depends on your point of view, it's all relative, you know, they're saying that because of that interest, they're saying that. All kind of humanity teaching is fairly poor for that reason, it's just teaching you scepticism. It's not very good. And all science teaching is just teaching you techno, it's just teaching you managerialism, 
So that's not very good. Whereas science teaching should teach you, teach you how things really are, it should teach you how they ought to be used. Whereas humanities teaching is exactly the study of the norms that make human society possible. So actually, I think universities do a very bad job. Yeah. That would be my choice. Not Catholic universities, yeah. of course. <laughs> Not all of them, anyway. I think we have time for one more question. Thank you. I was wondering your opinion of the recent referendum in Iceland about supporting or under, not underwriting the debt of the banks there and the reaction of uh, Gordon Brown to Iceland's uh, uh, not underwriting them. That's very interesting. I think Gordon Brown used terrorist legislation against people from Iceland. There's about 12 of them. You know, <laughs> see, see, slightly, slightly extreme. But I was grateful to Gordon, who's obviously not a great mate of mine, um, because it, it demonstrates exactly what I'm talking about, the extreme use of authoritarian powers. I mean, basically what happened with poor Iceland is that they, they believed the lie. They, they let the banks gain the state. Remember when I talked about how banks had essentially gained their sovereign tax base? When in Iceland, the sovereign tax base couldn't cope. That's why they're broken. And that, and that will happen again. If we just recover and restore the banking system in the same way, and we don't break up these big monopolies, and remember, the monopolies on capital itself. Capitalists go concentrating about just four firms that they can create differential price movements just by moving in and out of a market. And since they know when they are going to move out, they're always going to profit from those price differentials anyway. So capitalism itself, capital has been monopolized. So unless, unless we can in some sense tackle that, we're not going to tackle anything. But it's been a great pleasure. I think we're sort of conversations outside. If anyone wants to talk to me, I'd be more than delighted. Thank you very much. <laughs>